Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles podcast, a bi-weekly talk show, which we call Things We Said Today. This is a program where we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, the group, the solo years, what's going on in the news. Occasionally, we have interviews on this show, which is the case on today's program. I'm Ken Michaels, and you might be familiar with my other work on the Beatles, a syndicated Beatles radio show called Every Little Thing. There's also another podcast show that I do called Talk More Talk on the solo careers of the Beatles. And I'm being joined by my two regulars here on Things We Said Today. First of all, a man who's been in New York radio for well over 30 years at New York's WFUV. And he's done tremendous work there on the air, interviewed countless people. And he is a Beatle fan extraordinaire. And that's Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Hello, Ken. You are too kind. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Also, we have with us a musicologist who has written a number of books on the Beatles, including The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and more recently the e-book, which was called Got That Something? How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. He also writes for Beatle Fan Magazine and is a freelance writer for The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, and other publications. And that's our own Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hey, I'm so intimidated by you guys. I, can I interview you instead of you interviewing me? You know? I, think, I think we'd entertain that thought. We'll have to talk about that later. Yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway... That voice that you just heard is that of our special guest on the show, and that's Ken Mansfield. Ken is the former U.S. manager for Apple Records. He has a brand new book out, which is called The Roof, The Beatles' Final Concert. It's on a variety of subjects, actually, his entire career working with the Beatles. And, of course, as I mentioned, he was the former U.S. manager for Apple Records. There's so much that I would love to talk about, as my co-host would like to, about his time with Apple. And also, he was there on the rooftop with the Fab Four on that historic day of January 30th, 1969. And I am hoping that this show will be up and on the Internet on the 50th anniversary on January 30th. That should be happening. But um, Ken was one of the few and privileged to be there on the Apple rooftop, and we welcome you, Ken, to our show. This is fun. I'm glad I'm here. Thank you, guys. Welcome, Ken. Why don't we mention his previous two books while we're at it so collectors out there can get them all. There's <laughs> yeah. the Beatles, the Bible, and Bodega Bay from 2000, and there is the White Book I'm not sure what year that was. Um, 2007. 2007. Seven. And my copy, at least, is a numbered collector's edition. So I don't know if they all were, but... Um... I can one-up you, Alan. I have two copies because of the numbers. I had to get the lowest one that the bookstore had. And then, of course, then there's the second one for the museum. But uh... Ah, of course. But, uh, I, you know, before we get uh, started chatting about this new book, I was very fascinated at uh, Ken's uh, incredible resume. Uh, these three Beatle books are three of seven books that he's published. And uh, and he's accomplished so many things in, in what is a very wonderful career. And uh, needless to say, it's a thrill to have, have you with us, Ken. Thank you. Indeed, we should have several shows with you so we can cover everything that you've done. I'm sure we'd love to do that. But let's just talk very briefly because I know we want to get to talking about Apple and about the rooftop. If you can just summarize very quickly what led you to work with the Beatles and to become the U.S. manager for Apple, for Apple Records, I should say. I was uh, working in the space industry when I got out of college, and uh, I was in a group that I'd formed when I was in, in college in my fraternity, and we used to play around. So when I got in the space industry after I graduated, I still played on weekends. And I kept running into this guy from uh, Capitol Records. And one night he said, after our show, he said, did you ever think about going to work for a record company? I said, yeah, my dreams. And he said, well, I'm with Capitol. I'm like, oh my gosh, Capitol is always my favorite, favorite label. And, and uh, he said, well, if you're interested, I'd like to uh, recommend you for the position we have up there and I'll sponsor you. So uh, he was a four freshman manager at the time. Mm -hmm. and a capital executive, head of artist relations. And 
he sponsored me and I got the job and I went to work in uh, in January of 1965, first day of of the year that the company was open. And eight months later, I'm working with the Beatles. Now, I mean, that's... (laughs) That's pretty pretty amazing to jump to that you know point, but I worked with them on their '65 tour on the West Coast, and uh, we uh, had an unusual situation between us in the fact that I was a suntanned young guy their age with a Cadillac convertible and a house in the Hollywood Hills with a pool, and uh, they were kind of fascinated with the California thing. You can picture growing up in Liverpool, you know, and so I think I symbolized kind of everything that they had, had, uh, you know, thought of growing up. And this is not an ego thing or not a great thing. It's just that I happened to be in the right place at the right time. And they they, they were a little bit fascinated with that image. So they had a day off the next day. And they said, well, look, uh, why don't you come up and spend the day and we can, you know, ask you more questions where Mulholland Drive is and all this kind of thing. So I hung out with them the next day. So I worked with them professionally and then hung out with them for a day and we really kind of got to know each other and feel comfortable with each other. They come back the next year. I work with them again on the 66 tour. And then I thought, you know what, this is going really good. I, I, I think I got something happening here. I may end up, you know, working with these guys or something. I was pretty excited. And so put them on the plane, they went up to San Francisco and they did the last concert up there. And I did for two years. I never heard a word. So I, I thought, well, that's the end of that little fantasy, you know. So that dream didn't happen. And then out of the blue, Ron Cass, who was uh, the new president of Apple, called uh, Stanley Gordico at uh, the president of Capital and said, uh, lads are starting up the label and, and they want Ken McMurray to help them to uh, put it together because uh, America's the main place. For us, because America was 50% of all records sold worldwide at that time. So uh, they they were smart enough already as businessmen to do that they had to do America. That had to be where the launch, the main part of the launch was. So uh, anyway, they flew me over and, and Gordico and, and uh, the famous Apple meetings that you've seen pictures, a lot of pictures of. And we put the label together as far as the release and the four records and the just everything about the, the promotion and what we were going to do. and. Uh, I was going to hire special men to work on all this kind of stuff, but really just down and, and uh, you know, just real, real business things that we did. Mm. Okay. I'm long here, so I'm sorry. I'm, I've, I got you me. must, <laughs> you definitely must have made an impression because the two year silence goes by, yet they still remembered and uh, sought you out for their new venture. Yeah, I think what probably happened is, uh, uh, they didn't know hardly anybody over here, naturally, and uh, I think they were keeping track because those two years, I mean, I just skyrocketed up in the company. So here they somebody they knew, they had a good vibe about, and they knew I knew America, and because I was involved in arts relations and promotion and merchandising and all these things, it was all the things that they needed for the label to start with. And when Cass and, and Paul came over, you know, the relationship with Cass and me just was really sweet. And uh, so everything just kind of fell together, I guess. Did uh, did you guys talk a lot about the current music scene and and share who your favorite artists were and connect on that level? Well, the one thing that was clear from the start was they really loved America's roots, the root music of America, you know, the R&B and the, the rockabilly and, and uh, they were just very aware of all the American artists and Capital was a pretty cool place because we had all the legendary artists at that time that were being phased out because of the Beatles. You know, we had the four freshmen, we had Peggy Lee, we had Stan Kenton, we had George Shearing, and we had the four preps, we had, I forget who else, you know, all these and of course Sinatra. You had the Beach Boys who they admired. Well, yeah, and then I was getting to that. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but I mean, that was, the Beach Boys were there. And as you know, they had a very healthy... Uh, I don't know if you want to call it a competition, but I think they really fed off of each other in a way, you know, and uh, Brian's creativity. Sometimes I wonder about uh, Sergeant Pepper and um, the single. Uh, oh, Good Vibrations. Strawberry Fields. Mm. No, I mean the single for the Beach Boys. Good uh, Vibrations. Good Vibrations. Good Vibrations, yeah. thank you. <laughs> uh, I just think uh, you know, sometimes I wonder if 
how much they fed off of each other when they were creating things that creative, you know, if they were, if they were inspiring each other or even trying to maybe one up each other in, in a friendly sort of way. You know? Yeah. Mm. Mm. I want to ask something that um, I have to backtrack here because a couple shows ago we had Bruce Spicer on this program, yeah. but I know that uh, you acknowledge him in the book. Yeah. And um, he was talking about how recently he was at the Fest for Beatle fans. And he said that um, the reason why the the other artists on Apple besides the Beatles didn't sell as well as they should is because Alan Klein didn't care about the other artists. To him, Apple was a label for the Beatles, for their group products and their solo products. And Peter Asher was there at the fest. I wasn't witnessing this at the time. And apparently Peter had nodded his head in agreement about this. Would you agree with that? And what kind of dealings did you have at all with Alan Klein? Well, it's it's hard for me to talk negatively of anything, but, you know, when I came aboard, there was just so much heart there, and there was so much enthusiasm, and uh, it was such a, a lighthearted, not the word, but it was just a thing with so many possibilities, and, and, and uh, as we were talking earlier, just together, about it, George really believed in Jackie Lomax, and George was willing to, you know, just to keep going with Jackie, and he would do anything to help help out Jackie's record and you know everybody was involved with uh, Paul with Mary Hopkin record and, and everybody was involved with something and Peter of course had James Taylor and it was really a, a place as they intended to be a place of, of heart and a place of just where an artist could really you know enjoy their artistry together and then when Klein came aboard uh, things changed things really changed and uh, kind of the fun went out of it now I know the money was pouring out and there were a lot of negatives to this this attitude but uh, there was something really beautiful about that it, I'll tell you what it was a bad idea I mean a good idea with a bad <laughs> kind of outcome in a way I guess you could say because it it kind of got a little crazy around there mm. did you sense that Alan Klein didn't care about the other artists I think um I'm going to try and make a simple analogy. You know, when they hire a new guy to come in and save a giant corporation, the first thing they do is they start axing things and they start looking at the books mm -hmm. and it becomes a, uh, instead of a creative place, the intention is to make it, uh, money and, and to clean people out and, you know, put their people in. So that's the impression I had. And yet, you know, Alan tried to get me to stay because Paul and Cass were the kind of the guys that really brought me and that's how the, the invitation seemed to be framed. And uh, he, when things were, when Paul wouldn't agree to, you know, to, to him, uh, I think he had the impression that I had more to say to Paul about things than I did, which I did not. I did have no influence over Paul, but I think Klein thought I did. Mm. So he flew out to, Cass had already hired me to come to MGM and I'd already said I would do it. And Klein came out. And uh, I think this is the kind of thing you guys would be, Kind of interested to sit there. I'm sitting at the Beverly Hill Hotel, and Klein said, "Okay," he said, "Here's the deal. I don't know what you make right now." He said, "But if this conversation is successful from this minute on, you make three times more than you used to." And oh, besides the Beatles, he said, "You will have uh, involvement with the Rolling Stones and Donovan, and uh, so I want you to rescind your acceptance with Cass and to stay with Apple." And uh, I uh, I just loved Cass and and uh, I didn't know what to do and I said well then that was a world famous tennis game we had where I told I, I told him if he could beat me in tennis because he had a racket with him I said because here I mean I was young and athletic and he looked like a, two eggs on the on the spindles you know um, <laughs> so, I mean I thought this guy doesn't never look like he walked outside of a building because he was an accountant and all that and, and so we got out of the tennis court. And I couldn't get that ball passed. That ball passed him. My gosh, this was not a tennis game. It was a negotiation. And the cast, I mean, Klein was a negotiator. And I think I finally beat him like 15 13, if you know uh, how tennis sets work. And uh, man, because uh, I talked to Cass, uh, and uh, Cass said, you know, Ken, I want what's good for your family, but you have to decide who you want to be. As, uh, associated with you know for the rest of your career and he said so 
that's your decision. Do you want to be Alan Klein's guy or what, what do you want to do? Mm. That must have been a real tough decision to make. <laughs> yeah, it really got temptation there, you know. Yeah, it really was. But of course, you know, Peter came with us, Peter Asher and myself and Cass and Mike Connor, who was publishing. So we really kind of had uh, Apple, kind of the Apple things t- kept with us, and we were all still in, in communication with the guys because uh, I had the unofficial uh, title of uh, their personal li- liaison between the UK and the United States. And uh, so they still would call me about things or, you know, uh, when Patty Harrison wanted to come in and buy furniture for Friar Park and when somebody wanted to come in and not be anybody know about, it, you know, they would call me and, and we would just, it was just a personal thing and cast, you know. Mm-hmm. Alan. Um, you were, you were talking about it and people have always felt in a way that you know apple was a great idea but the beatles weren't businessmen and uh you know it that was partly why it sort of didn't work but um in your book i was struck by uh you you talk about your first trip to london and they gave you a very meticulously arranged um schedule uh <laughs> with uh you know every moment accounted for and your observation at that point in the book is that they really kind of did want to be seriously uh, you know, businessmen in the sense of making this company work and and having it be a a great place with a great atmosphere. Um, you're just wondering what your your impression of is of those two different observations that that you hear a lot about Apple. Well, you know, here's the thing, and Paul said it and very clearly. He said, you know, as a band, we've accomplished everything any band could ever accomplish. You know, you can't be more number one than we've been. You can't be more successful. You know, everything we've done, we have really no no more mountains to climb, no more, you know, victories to win in this area. We've, we've done it all. And they really relish the idea of being businessmen and setting up this corporation. I mean, think how serious were they were. Where did they where did they go to set up the the company? The Mayfair district, one of the you know most upscale districts in London. Savile Row, the you know the place of the bankers and the high tone tailors, all that. In a very historical building, and I mean they were serious. And when we were in the meetings, I was stunned because I'm working with a rock and roll band, and these guys are on time. I even joke with people. I almost uh, when I got going, I felt like they should have a white polyester short sleeve shirt with a little a plastic thing with the pens in it, you know, because <laughs> they were so organized and the, the questions were very astute. They listened, they wanted to learn, uh, they wanted to impart what they were looking to do. And uh, the dialogue, it was almost like I was at Capitol in a board meeting mm-hmm. and having a meeting with other executives. I was having a meeting there with uh, the four presidents of Apple and the president of, of Capitol. And so it was a lot of, you know, it was like a regular board meeting, and it was fascinating. And they also were very kind to me. And I really kind of realized later that they knew if I was going to run the company in America, I had to feel involved, that I was a part of the team. And uh, we got there, and the schedule, as you said, you know, showed that kind of the idea was we would do things with all four, and then I would, um, Stan and I would go with Ringo to do the theater, and then we would go to lunch, or we'd do, you know, we just did things individually and collectively, so he really wanted me to uh, to feel involved, took us in the building and introduced us to everybody and walked us around, and it was just, um, they were really, uh, I thought, into it. They, they liked being businessmen. Mm-hmm. Ken, as the head of Apple in the U.S., how much time would you say roughly did you spend in London? And, you know, as the U.S. head, the fact that you were at Apple around the time of the rooftop, uh, did you spend a lot a lot of time over on the other side of the pond as opposed to in L.A.? No, I spent almost um, really uh, 75, 80 percent of my time in L.A. Uh, I went over there maybe four times in a short, pretty short period of time from, you know, the middle of uh, 68 to the end of 70. Or, yeah, end of 70. But I would go over like a week at a time. And- right, right. Can you tell us about the uh, days or day or whatever amount of time it was leading up to January 30th, 1969, uh, when you 
what what at what point did you join uh, the proceedings of those sessions that led up to the day the Beatles went up on the roof? Yeah, I had no idea that they were going to be on the roof, and it was just total one of the, one of the greatest coincidences for me in the world. I was just in the offices working that week and a bunch of different things, and uh, a funny thing happened the day. This is so coincident to our conversation. Is uh, you know, in the book I write about being in the studio with them at the Apple Building, working on the Let It Be album, and sitting on the floor next to Billy, who was an old friend at that time. And uh, all I've had is that as a memory. And Mark Lewison sent me an M3, MP3 today of me walking in the door when I came in on January 28th. And the guy said, "Hi, Ken. Welcome." Uh, and he's just chatting with me while they're while they're tuning and picking and and all that. And so it was just incredible to to relive that, you know, that moment, because I had no idea that I was on any tapes any place during that time. So that was the 28th, and that kind of nailed down the sequence between the time I was in the studio with them and the time we went up on the roof, which was two days later. Two so, days. Okay. Yeah. And when do you recall the first time that you heard we're going up on the roof uttered out of someone's mouth? Was the first time I heard about going up on the roof? Yeah, when, when yeah. It, was it day of? Was it being tossed around on the 28th? Do you recall the first time you heard? Yeah. Uh, well, we'll go up on the roof. Well, the thing was, is the, the, the film itself, one of the, the points of the film was to have a live, a live uh, show with the Beatles in it, you know. And uh, that kept not happening. And, of course, I knew about them doing uh, the, the concert for the film because Mal had called me and said that the Beatles wanted me to check out a desert in America, and he was going to check out the Sahara, and they thought about you know setting up on a desert, inviting every kid in the world to come to the concert. And then, of course, you've read all the others. I listed about 20 of them in the book, but the Coliseum and a flour mill and all these kind of things. But uh, nothing ever happened of any of these things. And so I'm in the office, and about... Two days before, I started hearing noise in the building, like in some construction, and I thought it was just maybe somebody's office was being remodeled. And uh, that day, and I can't figure out to this day why I wasn't included in a conversation there when I wasn't included in conversation when I was in L.A., but I had no idea until Mal walked in the office I was using and said, hey, Ken, I'm going up on the roof in about 15 minutes. And that's the first I heard of it when I was there, so I had no idea. Oh, wow. So and the, the, noise, the noise I was hearing is they were building the planks up on, on the roof, and they were also uh, reinforcing Peter Asher's office with timbers and beams. So, you know, that roof wasn't made for a bunch of people and equipment. So just in case it fell through, it was going to fall through. They would have protect the office below, too. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh. That's very yeah. fascinating. Yeah. That's something, because if you had been in L.A. at that time, they wouldn't have notified you in advance about this. Yeah. So, uh you just happened to be in the right place. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they would contact me. I think I would have heard about it the same time everybody else did, you know, at that point. You talk in the book about one thing I had always wondered, which was how cold it was. It was apparently bitter, <laughs> bitter cold. So why didn't they just clear out a space in, you know, in the studio or in one of the Apple offices and ha invite some people in and just play it inside where it was warm? Well, I think they wanted to do a live concert and for people, you know, and now think about it. Why was it planned at noontime on a, on a busy work day on South of Row, you know, because right. they knew that people were in the streets and stuff like that. And I just I think it was a fascinating, fascinating idea. And like I, you know, it was their last concert. So I think I said in the book they wanted to go out on top. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's really like they've always done. And it was cold up there because there was the wind to, you know, I think it was probably about 40 degrees roughly, but it was kind of a damp type of day in the wind and there was no shielding up there. There really wasn't. Uh, you see Yoko and I and Maureen and Chris O'Dell sitting next to that chimney. That was not a working chimney. It was just kind of a windbreak. You know, and I mean, it was cold. In fact, John said he couldn't even play because his hands were tired or cold and, you know. I always wondered, uh, we know one of them had to be Mal Evans, but who were the lucky guys that had to uh, carry all the gear up to the roof? <laughs> yeah, I know Mal was part of it. I don't know who else was. Uh, 
But uh, that was quite a job. If you the fifth the, the, the stairway up to the roof from the from the top floor was a kind of a narrow, rickety thing, and it had a bend in it. Uh, some people call it a ladder. Uh, it was, you know, wasn't a real. And so they had to haul this stuff up. And of course, uh, as you know, they couldn't get Billy's uh, stuff up there, so they had to take actually disassemble the sky uh, skylight. Skylight. I keep wanting to say Skylark, <laughs> but, uh, and uh, get this stuff up through that, and then they had to seal it back up again uh, against the weather. So uh, it was a big job. A big wow. job. You know, Ken, you always hear about the concert only lasted 42 minutes. Yeah. What a shame it was that the cops had to, to end it all. But when you look at what they played that day, they only did five songs. Yeah. And they repeated Get Back. They did it three times. They did I've Got a Feeling twice. They did um, Don't Let Me Down twice, I think. Were there really plans for this to be any full concert? Because for all we know, that might have been all they were ready to do. You know, I could only give you my impression of what was happening that day is because uh, you brought up the police and this whole thing about the police shutting them down, all that, like a big dramatic thing. It was nothing dramatic about it uh you know we mal had locked the door downstairs and so they could and another thing about being up on the roof is nobody could bother them nobody from the other offices nobody could bother them up there because there was just a handful of us that were up on the roof that day but they had locked the door downstairs and then uh it became such a commotion and so much problem from the the uh, people on the businessmen on the street that the police were forced to come and start knocking on the door and Mal went down, and uh, Mal was the most gentle guy I've ever met in the world. He just schmoozed him, and he said, "Okay, I'll let like a couple of you up." And and but you got you know by the time they were up on the top of the roof, uh, Mal had kind of arranged it, not, not to just shut them down like when we and arrest everybody, but uh, you can look at the film and you can see Mal and what that cop standing there just kind of. Weighing around, you know, it's almost like Mal said, okay, we got what we want. <laughs> now you can shut them down, you know. And uh, so uh, I'm not even sure who pulled the plug on. Uh, you probably know. I don't know if there's even one of the policemen who pulled the plug. And then I think John put it back in or something. But, yeah, there was no big deal. They got what they wanted and... That was it. You would think that the policemen, um, who, from what you can see in the film, are relatively young guys, would rather yeah. have been doing anything than shutting down a Beatles performance. <laughs> well, that was it. They were thrilled. Mal said, you know, I'll let you go up there. You get to see the Beatles. You know, you'll, be, you'll be part of this thing. And so they were willing to really go along. And the funniest thing of this whole day is I forget the people that were really, really pushing to get the thing shut down. Off of the guys down in Salva Row, a banker and a tailor or something. But uh, by the time they got up there and the concert was over and then this music stopped, they thought they had shut it down. And, uh, they, you know, because it does take time to get the police and get them up the stairs and uh, all that stuff. So the, the people on the road that were complaining thought they had shut the concert down. There was no such thing. The concert was just the length that was going to go. And that was it, you know. Now, maybe the Beatles, maybe because they were really jamming, they may have stayed on a jam for a while. I don't know. You know, but it was done. They got what they wanted. Mm -hmm. It it looks from the film like they had recorded the uh, the acoustic things and things that needed a piano, like you know, "Let It Be," "Long and Winding Road," and two of us downstairs in the studio the day before, and that those were filmed, you know, in f their finished versions, like as if they were promo films, and that the rooftop stuff was the electric stuff that they could play as yeah. a band that didn't need extra pianos yeah. and things. That's why I invited Brent, Brent Stoker to, uh, to write a chapter in the book because he, mm. he knows these kind of things. So he did a very thorough thing on kind of what they used from, from downstairs and stuff like that. Ken, was there, um, you mentioned you uh, only a handful of people were on the roof, including yourself, the wives, Chris O'Dell. I would imagine the offices, it was a weekday and the offices were buzzing and that there were a lot of people at work that day. Didn't everybody want to get up on the roof or yeah. were some people actually told, please stay, stay, you know, back in your office? All those things. Um, first of all, the roof was not strong enough to hold a lot of people or the equipment. And uh, 
they did the planking for about a maybe 12 feet wide and 15 feet long. It was a very small space. And so they're on that on that sweet spot, there were the four Beatles and Billy Preston and a couple sound men and a couple uh, cameramen. And then what I call the audience, which was uh, Yoko, Maureen, Ringo's wife, myself and Chris O'Dell, Peter Asher's assistant. And uh, so we were the audience. And it was really what it was, was actually another day at the office for most people. I mean, Neil Aspinall went, went to the dentist that day. And he's never like three or four feet away from the guys. And uh, some guys that stayed in their office, they never really thought, because there's always something happening at Apple. This is just another thing that was going on, you know, the Beatles were doing. So a lot of people didn't think anything about it. And the people that did weren't just weren't allowed up there. Chris uh, makes quite a deal, big deal about how her getting up there, because she really, she was bound and determined she was going to get up there, and she did. And... Uh, we laugh about that all the time because here we were, the two Westerners up there uh, sitting on the roof being uh, the only, we, we had no business up there. And Yoko, myself, Marina, Chris, we were just an audience. That's all we were, you know. Right. Kevin now, Harrington, um, I guess, had work to do there, like hold lyrics up for John. Yeah, yeah, so that- yeah. He was their equipment guy, so he had kind of a you know good reason for being up there. I mean, if it wasn't for Mal, I know I wouldn't have been up there. Mal just always treated me so good, and he, he and I had gotten so close over the years, and especially when we were on the road with Jackie. We, we spent a really a lot of, you know, close time together, and uh, so he, he made sure I was up there. Hmm. I know that you do say in the book that uh, Peter Asher wasn't there. He was in Los Angeles at the time. Yeah. I tease Peter because that's very convenient that he happened to be in – Los Angeles, the end of January, you know, so. (laughs) And uh, Neil Aspinall had his tonsils out that day. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was a dentist. Was it his tonsils? I believe it was his tonsils, yeah. That's what I had heard. Okay. I think it's what it says in the book, actually. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And he, uh, I didn't know if it was an elective or whether he actually had to go, and that's the reason he wasn't there. And I've asked around, and nobody knows why Neil wasn't there. And why wasn't Derek there? And Derek yeah, was, yeah, that's and a good Derek, question. That's, I mean, that's he's, I was ask him. he's a single person that should have been there because that was his gig to, you know, for things like this to make a big deal out of him. And, and Derek was always like the heart of everything anyway. Uh, and so I can't figure out why he wasn't there. I know why nobody else was invited from the media up there because uh, Apple was smart enough and Derek was smart enough to know that if he invited one newspaper up there and didn't invite another, he would make one friend and a hundred enemies and the same thing with music, everybody knows. So that was one thing they kept that really a secret from the, from the public. They didn't let anybody know until it was actually happening. That mm-hmm. It was happening. Ken, can you shed a little light on the volume up there? during the performance and, uh, and what was it sounding like possibly down on the street level? Well, my recollection is uh, the volume wasn't that blasting up there to me. I don't know. And, you know, we were sitting four to six feet away and it was loud, but it wasn't like blasting. But uh, one of the people at Apple, I can't remember his name, didn't know what was happening and was coming back to the office around that time. And he said he turned the, the the corner on Salva Road, he said it was like a wall of sound, you know, just coming down the street. And uh, so it almost sounds like it was louder on the street than it was on the roof. And I don't, I don't know if that's just the way the speakers were set up and that the sound carried more that way. But I do not remember. And I, I remember being in concerts and being places where I couldn't already stand it with my ears. I mean, fifth row for The Who or, you know, the, some of these bands, you know. So to me, it wasn't that loud. Is there any truth to all that you hear about of all these different locations the Beatles were considering for this concert? I mean, even to the point where they mentioned um, a, an old Roman amphitheater in Tunisia. Yeah. I yeah. mean, did they really think about any of these You can hear it on locations? the Niagara Reels. You can hear them talking about it on the, the outtakes. And, and wow. at one point, I think they, they were talking about doing it on, a, on shipboard, and, and Ringo turned <laughs> to them and said, you're all crazy. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think some of the ideas were genuine. I think some of them were very grandiose. 
And I think some of them were individual persons' ideas that never got more than the, maybe from the meeting room and the discussion. I know that there were explore, explorations into some of them, serious explorations into some of the ideas. And uh, even though Mal and I were asked to go scout out deserts, I was never given walking papers to actually go do it. It was just something that I was being, that I, they thought maybe I should go do, you know, so. You made a funny comment in the book about how uh, Paul came up with some particularly outlandish idea and they decided that he should be banned from Derek's office and dispensary <laughs> henceforth. Well, Derek's office, there was a lot of champagne going on and very nice odor in there, you know, from uh, from incense, I guess, you or whatever, you know. So, yeah, um, a lot Paul, of... Paul calls them um, herbal jazz cigarettes. Yeah, <laughs> mm. yeah. And Derek's office... <laughs> In the book was so cool because when I got these uh, pictures of the guys working there off different office stuff, you notice nothing was really fancy about the general decor of the place. It was just people doing things. It was just, it's almost like nobody had time to really hang up a lot of pictures or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, Neil's office and stuff was a little different, but uh, that place was just crazy. I mean, and Derek's office was just madhouse. You never knew who was going to be in there. Cristal champagne, uh, cordon bleu chef. Yeah, would you like something to eat? You know, and uh, it was just—he was always holding court in his wicker chair. I mean, just you know, <laughs> sit there and see. And he loved it. You could tell he just had a great time. Ken, can you shed a little light then on a uh, post performance and what went down once the Beatles were finished and they put their instruments down? What the rest of the day or the breakdown of the equipment or whatever recollection you have of uh after the performance any memories no and i don't remember any of that i know that uh we just went downstairs and i went back to whatever office i was working out of and i i, I got on the plane the next morning and got out of there so it's just something if i could mention it when the beatles came up there that day i'd stopped by the, the office they were using for uh the dressing room you might call it the green room or whatever they had because to deliver a message to somebody, and I thought they were, they kind of seemed like really nervous, and I thought maybe they're just nervous about playing live and getting together what they were going to do, and it almost looked, uh, like I said, like a band getting ready for an audition, which is funny because what John said afterwards. Mm -hmm. But um, I learned later that the tension was just a tension between, it had nothing to do with uh, them being nervous or being, you know, anything like that. But somebody told me later that, the minute before they walked on the roof, they were virtually at the door before the door opened that they hadn't decided for sure whether they were going to go out there. And uh, uh, I think uh, was John just said, well, come on, just screw it. Let's go do it and get it over with because they needed the footage for the film. And that was the thing. And when they came out on the roof, they brought that tension out with them. But when they started playing, and this is for me, being with the Beatles was phenomenal. Being on the roof was double phenomenal. But the thing I saw up there that day was the one thing that tops everything that had to do with that was when they started playing, and I'm tell I'm, I was about four to six feet away, John turned to Paul or Paul turned to John, and they had this exchange that was like, you know what, this is us. You know, Forget about what all this stuff is going down. This is who we are. We're a live rocking band. And we've been mates forever. We've been through all kinds of stuff together. And right now, playing right this moment, this is who we are. And uh, you notice in the film, I mean, they're just having a, they're having a good time. You know, John's throwing out the quips and, the, you know, Paul is saying something over to Mo, uh, Mo on the, uh, with where we were sitting. And they're just, uh, they just were rocking out like a, a band, you know. And I think uh, I wrote in the book, my favorite line is, they came up on the roof day that day without a sound check, but they walked off with a soul check. And I really think they almost needed that, that moment together where they felt that thing of who they were and what they were. I just think they got to return to that for, for 42 minutes or however long that happened. You know? Wow. So the tensions were, were overflowing just seconds before they walked out on the roof. That's fast, fascinating. Yeah, yeah that's what... Uh, I saw it in the room and thought it was something else. And then I was, I don't know who, who told me that about them almost not even walking through the door when they got up there. But wow. 
the interesting thing up there was it was another day at the office. It was something that had to be done, and there was all there was a million other things going on at the time. But as I was sitting there, and I thought, this is neat, I get to see that. But then after a while, I went, wait, something's going on here, something special. And I just had this feeling like, I don't know, something's happening here. It's like, I don't really understand it. And uh, they went out, and the four, you know, Chris and I and Maureen and Mo, I mean, and Yoko walked down, and none of us said anything to each other. And uh, I, like I said, I went down to my office and got on a plane the next day and left. And Chris and I had talked about this. We didn't really talk about it probably for 20 years later, and she felt the same thing. And we didn't know what it was. It wasn't like I was going, gee, this is the last time the Beatles are going to play live together. Gee, they're going to break up after a while. Gosh, you know, the whole Apple thing is going to do all this kind of stuff. It was just, we just had a feeling. And uh, none of us talked about it for a long time. It was a f- funny thing. And then then it realized later that the thing we were sensing, sensing it was one of the most historical moments in rock and roll, you know, because it represented a lot of things more than just that concert. Right. You know, and Ringo said many times that despite whatever problems the group was going through, when they concentrated on the music, if you close your eyes, they would be completely focused on that. And all their other problems would just, they wouldn't even think about it. It was just, you know, wonderful, just just playing and being a great band together. He said that after about the concert? Well, not specifically about this concert, but okay. just in general. Yeah. About the yeah. band. Yeah. Yeah. Because he kind of enjoyed himself up there that day, I think. Because he was kind of in the back, you know, and he was drumming, and he was a good time, and he was watching the people coming out. Of, you know, they were coming out of windows and on ledges and <laughs> on the other roofs and stuff, and it started out with just a few of us up there, and pretty soon, you know, there's just people all over the place on the other buildings mm-hmm. across. The, the picture, I think, of me on the roof, uh, the one picture uh, was taken, I think, from a building across the street. And... Uh, off of another rooftop. It's. Oh. I've seen some pictures. I know that the uh, the building uh, uh, through the decades has gone through some significant overhauls and renovations, and even the roof itself. There were some renovations done, uh, and you know, like the doorway is in a different location now. And but some of the pictures that I've seen online, that was one small rooftop, and it's a good thing the Beatles weren't afraid of heights because. <laughs> it, it's you know when you see the movie you get a picture in your mind that was one thing yeah all right then when you actually see pictures you realize that they were only a few steps from walking to the edge yeah did you picture those cameramen that are over on that one edge because there was no railing of any if there was railing it wasn't enough to keep somebody from falling off or anything like that yeah right. it was a small space because it was i said it's like maybe 12 by 15 feet or something it's a pretty small space Right, right. Does anybody have any more questions about the Apple Rooftop concert? Because I just have a, a few questions about working at Apple sure. in particular. I want to know, were you close at all with any of the Apple recording artists, or were you just basically there to work the records? I know you talked about Jackie Lomax, that yeah. you and George and Mal went on a tour together yeah. of the U.S., yeah. Um, are there is there anything you can shed uh, any insight about the artists that you work for with Apple and did you get to know any of them on a personal level? Not really, just Jackie, and uh, because I did work with him, you know, on the tour, I worked with Mary Hopkin briefly in uh, New York when she came in and did, I think, one of her very first shows. It was a, a nightclub, in one of the really big posh hotels, one of the really big rooms, you know, mm-hmm. there. But that's the only time I really worked with anybody and spent a lot of time with them. And the, the bad thing are the guys in the group were around in the offices and things like that. But I never really hung with anybody. But uh, And it was funny thing about you mentioning the Jackie Lomax tours. When we got ready to, to go, uh, Mal said, OK. He said, Jackie, in my mind, he said, is equivalent to the Beatles. And we will, and he's telling me, and we will treat them with that same respect on the road. If Jackie says something, we do it. And Mal would make sure that uh, when Jackie was ready to leave the room, that nobody was in the way, that the car was waiting right outside. And Jackie, he treated Jackie just like he would have any one of the Beatles or the band. He treated him with great respect. 
And uh, I just thought that was really special about Mal and how he treated you know, the artist. And George, during that whole time, was on the phone with us and just following everything. And when we got off the plane in L.A., when the tour was over, George was waiting for us at the gate. Now, think about that. And nobody even noticed him. And the four of us are walking down, you know, LAX, just walking side by side, just talking away. And no, no one person even stopped us. We didn't realize that it was a Beatle walk. And this was, you know, this was 68 or whatever it was. This was a time when they were pretty darn famous. But it was very personal. It was very personal. With George and his artists, especially with like Doris Troy and, and the other artists he was working with. Were you in the studio with Jackie when he was in L.A.? Recording the album uh, yeah, with George? We work, working on things there, and that's when it turned into uh, George ended up working on the White Album, too, while we were there, the mastering of the White Album. Yeah, you had told me several years ago that he wasn't happy with the way the White Album was mastered. Not mixed, but mastered. No, mastered. He thought the sound was, uh, I think, he th think he really felt they compressed it too much and, and kind of knocked the life out of it. He was very upset because... He came out of the tower after hearing this stuff, and he said, uh, "He said I got to get this thing over with." He said, "You know, this album it just wore us out." He said, "It was just too much. We took on more than we really maybe should have." And he said, "I just want to wrap this damn thing up." And and uh, we went into Armin Steiner's studio because Armin was one of the most <laughs> famous engineers in town, and uh, George worked with him. And I was in the studio while he was working on things. I heard the White Album. Not in from one from one end to the other. I heard it in these little pieces, you know. Mm. So it's kind of an odd way to hear it. But would have been interesting to hear it before George yeah. reworked yeah. it, you know, to yeah. hear it with a lot more compression. Just um, one quick question here: Did you get to? Is there anything you could share with us about working any of the solo Beatles music on radio? And in particular, I'm wondering about with Ringo. Right out of the gate, his first two albums were not pop albums. He did an album of standards with Sentimental Journey. Yeah. He did an album of, of country music with Bukus of Blues. Was, yeah. that, was that really difficult to, to work with radio? And in particular, because I know you, you love country music too. Yeah. Uh, how was Ringo received on country radio? I think it was kind of a, an, an amusing thing. Kind of a, I'm, I'm looking for a word that was kind of quirky to some of the people and kind of interesting. You know, the country people loved it, the Ringo honored their music that way and went to Nashville and and all these things. I was with uh, Ringo and George Martin when he did that, that the uh, oldies type album. And mm. we went off to a studio outside of London someplace. I don't even know where we were, but it was interesting to see that side of, of an individual Beatle because Ringo loved country music. And, he, and so, you know, Capitol, we had this great roster with Buck Owens and Merle Haggard and Sonny James and all these people. And and uh, so Ringo's asked me to send him records. So I sent him every Capitol record every month that came out, every country record. And finally, one day he called me and said, hey, I can't afford duty on these things anymore. <laughs> Would you please stop? Because like I said, I'm always running down to customs or trying to get this stuff. Yeah. You told me years ago he really loved the Outlaws stuff. Yeah. You know, well, Waylon Jennings and stuff like that. Yeah, well, that's the last time I saw John was uh, Ringo had, had called me because he knew I just got back from L.A. Uh, finishing uh, mixing and producing uh, Waylon's uh, Are You Ready for the Country album. And uh, Ringo called and said, I hear you got the tapes with you. Can I hear them? And I, I said, yeah. And he said, well, what about this afternoon? I said, okay. So I go over there. In the meantime, John shows up. And this was during the lost years i guess whatever you want to call them and i walk in and john's there and i had gone from that that because john had come because he really wanted to talk to ringo about some personal things and so i'd gone from being invited to being an intruder in a way because <laughs> R ringo had me put on the tapes and all that and john's just sitting there just waiting for the whole thing to get over with because you know he wanted to be alone with ringo so that's the last time i saw him but yeah ringo was and we had a, a party uh, Waylon played the, the Roxy, and so Ringo held a party for him upstairs in the private room. And uh, so we had all the outlaw guys come up, and Ringo had all his glam rock friends and people like that. We got in this room, and it was like cattlemen and sheepmen because there was 
all the outlaws and all those kind of guys on one side of the room and all the rockers on the other side, there was this divide in between them. And they're like looking at each other. And so Ringo and I walked out in the center and we called Whalen out. You know, we go to this and stuff like that. And, and then pretty soon everybody's getting together. But uh, he was very much into, into Whalen and the country music. Wow. You know, I know a lot of fans wish that Ringo had continued making more country music because we look back now at Blue Coos of Blues and if that album has gotten a lot more respect through the years. Yeah. In those catalogs, so. Did you have much interaction with Paul over the years, in his solo years? Afterwards, no. Okay. Basically none, yeah. Yeah, pretty much after Apple, uh, it was pretty much over with him more than, well, him and John more than and George and Ringo. You kept in touch with George, I think, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, George and Patty and my wife, we've become friends, and we've spent quite a bit of time together in L.A., uh, just personally. And uh, I was you know, with him when he did the Bangladesh, when he reworked the Bangladesh album over in AM Studios. We were there, and George, there were some things he just wasn't going to let go, even though we were live. He just said he just couldn't have that on the record. So he, he cleaned some things up, and, and uh, we were very comfortable with each other. Uh, we were kind of very alike in a way. We were both kind of quiet and reclusive, and and um, it was we were comfortable with each other. I think. You also but, said that um, you you uh, worked on promoting Ringo's "Time Takes Time" album. Well, yeah, I put that deal together. Actually, uh, I had uh, uh, called Ringo and told him I had a concept for an album. This is when he just finished the Chipped Moments thing, and things weren't really happening much for you know, just nothing was happening, and. Uh, he said, well, yeah. I said, I'm interested. And then he said, are you going to be in L.A. soon? And I said, well, I'm producing the Flying Brito Brothers right now. I said, when are you going to be there? And I'll meet you there because I can just schedule my mixing on that then. And so we met and uh, talked about the next concept. I was in touch with all the record labels at that time. I was representing different artists. And he wanted to have a major label but he didn't want to, he wanted major distribution, but he didn't want a major label. He didn't want to be with a big label anymore. And here's private music uh, owned by uh, ex Tangerine Dream guy who was part of the Hunts, fortunes married into that or something. So he set up this beautiful label. And so here it was, it was distributed by RCA. So Ringo had a small label with people he could communicate with. And uh, it was a very kind of classy label and he had the big distribution. So it was kind of the perfect setup for him. So I put that deal together and then, uh, the meeting we had, and we're going back to something from the roof, is uh, he said, on this album, he said, I want to put together a great band. He said, the reason the Beatles were successful is he says, simple, we were just a really good band. Pure and simple, he said. He said, I'd like to kind of create that moment with some great musicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, with that album, you had a lot of different lineups because you had four different producers working on yeah. it yeah so but uh, it's such a solid album song yeah. for song it's like 10 perfect songs on an album it's yeah it's definitely i feel one of ringo's strongest and yeah. to me a really big comeback for him yeah you know it, it really was and it was good for uh, for him to get to do that then because he really needed that kind of support he needed the label uh, just treated him incredible because they were excited to have a beetle on the label so he was really given a home with a warm welcome and it's just you know he was an important artist to them at that time so in fact uh i'm, I'm, I'm rambling because i'm just enjoying talking to you guys but uh i went up to peter bauman's house to uh start putting the deal together on ringo and bruce kell made the deal i just kind of got laid all the groundwork so uh i went to peter bauman's house for breakfast one morning to talk the deal and i said well Peter, uh, let's put it this way. Uh, there are five people who have been the single most famous artists in the world, and those five people are four Beatles and Elvis Presley. And I said, uh, only three of those five people are left. And so you're getting one third of the most famous people in the world on your label. And he looked at me and said, oh, this is going to cost me, isn't it? <laughs> and then Kel came in for the kill, and it did cost him. So. Hmm. I was going to ask a question. I had one question regarding Badfinger, if that's okay. Uh, if I know the answer, yeah. Okay. Badfinger are, are a favorite band of mine, and 
I always felt like they were both very lucky and very unfortunate to end up on Apple. What are your thoughts on Badfinger? Uh, you know, here they they when they were still known as the Ivies, they get signed to uh, the up and coming label of the Beatles. But it seemed as though almost right away they ended up lost in the shuffle and their following was stronger in the United States. So I, I was wondering if you had any, uh, you know, recollections of helping push some of their hit singles here in the U.S., <laughs> Let me start from the beginning is because when I heard Maybe Tomorrow by the Ivies, I thought, man, this is going to be a monster. And I ordered 400,000 copies pressed so they would be out in the market and ready to go when the group, uh, when we released the record. Well, it only sold about 30,000 <laughs> records, I think. Uh, hmm. I just thought Maybe Tomorrow was just going to be a, like a Beatle record. and. Hmm. The only thing that saved my job was uh, with with Capitol. It was uh, the fact that uh, the Beatles were so excited that I was so excited about their product, and you know, uh, Capitol wasn't going to fool with me on anything like that. So mm -hmm. They let us slide. But I don't know the transition from the Ivies to Badfinger. Uh, I only saw the success of Badfinger. I never saw anything else. I know there was some, uh, some troubles going on eventually, but. I never saw that. I think I'm Mal, Mal came up with the name Badfinger, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm kind of boring in the fact that I didn't. I don't remember the bad stuff. I didn't see a lot of bad stuff. I was not privy to a lot of the things that went down a lot of times. Uh, the Beatles kept a lot of things close to their best in that way too. You know, that's uh, an interesting thought because. Um, you know, a couple of months ago when the White Album was about to be reissued, the 50th anniversary edition, we all uh, have spent our lives as Beatle fans thinking that the White Album sessions were were very uh, uh, tense. Giles Martin painted uh, a, a very different picture from hearing all of the audio that, no, it was a joyous time. So we, w I think all of us kind of spent uh, a little time thinking, well, was it joyous? Or was it ten? You know, was it tense, or was somewhere in between? And plus, now with you saying that you weren't too privy on too much of the negative stuff re regarding Apple, it really does seem that they did keep a lot of the inner stuff close to the vest and to themselves. Not a lot of it was yeah. visible, even to those close to them. Not a lot of what was going on deep at the heart of what Beatles and Apple was. Uh, was making its way out. Well, here's what's interesting, because I was working with them on Apple while they were making the White Album, because when we were doing all, a lot of this stuff, is the White Album was going along at the same time. And everything seemed upbeat, and when we were working together, and I had no sense of this until after talking with George, you know, later on, what a trauma the thing was in some ways. I had no sense of that from them when we were together and working on other things. So uh, that kind of surprised me. And I just thought about that later on. I thought, wow, I didn't realize that this was, supposedly I started reading about all these troubles going on. I had no sense of that. Wow. Well, I think it was probably like what you observed about the rooftop concert when they were about to go on. There were all those tensions, as you later found out. But once they started playing... Yeah. It, it was the band, and I think what Giles Martin heard were the tapes. That was when they were yeah. playing. That was when they yeah. were happy. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. I know uh, they kept tapes going all the time when they were doing the Let It Be album. The tapes were running. So when Mark Lewis, Lewis and sent me that stuff, I thought, my gosh, he must have listened to a million hours of tapes to dig out this one little thing to send to me, you know. When I walked in the door. <laughs> well, you know, the, the Nagra reels, um, which were recorded by the film crew for the whole sessions, are sort of out there among collectors. And there are a lot of people, including Mark, who are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the sessions by listening to the Nagra reels for each day's session on the 50th yeah. anniversary. Um, yeah. And that, that's probably why he sent it to you today, because yeah. he came upon yeah. it. You know. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. Because I know the detail he works at. It was an emotional experience for me, and uh, I was very blessed. And I think in the very beginning, the reason I hit it off the Beatles 
and this is a confession to people I can confess to, is I didn't quite get it. I couldn't understand what was the what was the big deal about this band. I mean, as far as I knew, they would be you know popping up wild and go away, you know, like every other band did. And so uh, I was very relaxed with them. I wasn't in awe of them. I didn't want to have my picture taken. I didn't want to have them signing things. I just I was a band I was working with, mm-hmm. and uh, so I think that was my attitude the whole time I worked with them. I just they were kind to me, and I liked what was going on, and it was just. It was a good time. That's what I remember. And maybe I'd forgotten the bad stuff. I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> and that could be a good reason why they enjoyed working with you because yeah. you wasn't you you wasn't fawning over them. Yeah, like fan would. It was yeah. a business to you. People yeah. ask me what's the re- thing behind success, and I think the biggest criteria for success is naivete. You know, you don't know you can't do something, so you know, or you just you're just with it. You know, you're not. Well, anyway, okay. <laughs> well, All right. Well, okay. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank uh, you, Ken. I, I hope you hope you get it out in time for the thirtieth. That'd be great. Well, this has been a joy talking with you, and we wish you continued success with the roof, which uh, I understand you were saying was the number one best-selling Beatle book on Amazon. In two days, yeah. There's this category, and one of them is the best-selling Beatles book, and it went to number one, bam. And I was kind of surprised. It's yeah. See, this tells you the power of the Beatles, that they have a category on Amazon for best-selling <laughs> Beatle books. <laughs> in fact, the publisher said, is this, is this a big deal, being number one Beatle books? I said, I don't know. I'm from the music business. Number one in anything is a big deal, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just be number one in something and tell everybody you were number one, and that sells records. So <laughs> there we are. <laughs> and if anybody wants to, they can order your book on Amazon. Yes. yes. And uh, it is really great to read because, like I said, it takes you through your entire career. It's just, it's not entirely about the rooftop concert. And uh, I can talk about the rooftop, especially all the Apple artists. And anytime you want to come back in, all you got to do is say the word. Okay. Great. Hey, you know, you brought up something. The point of the book was that I wrote this in the beginning. It was for people like yourselves that know a lot of things, but I just wanted you maybe to get some ideas about the personal things inside the building, just a little, like the Seinfeld show, they said, why was it successful? Jerry Seinfeld said, because it was a show about nothing. And the things that I enjoyed about the whole thing was the things about nothing, you know, the little things, the everyday things. And right. so I wanted, I wanted people who know a lot about the Beatles, maybe to get that extra little, aspect of them and the people who were Beatles fans but didn't care about the facts I wanted them to know more about know more about you know so it, it's mm-hmm. a it's a very good read it's very vivid it's very detailed and I, I I'm sure all three of us heartily recommend it oh Absolutely. thank you okay there all right we, Ken nice, nice thank you. To you and uh Ken you and I are in touch a lot so let me know if I can do anything okay I certainly will Ken, okay. thanks for being here with us. We really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So that was great. Ken Mansfield. Again, his new book is called The Roof, The Beatles Final Concert. And hopefully, maybe sometime in the future, we'll have him back again. And like I said, I can talk. Uh, I love talking about the Apple artists. We could do a whole show on that. Go more in depth if we can. But for the meantime, why don't we give all of our folks contact information, how they could reach us, starting with you, Darren. All right. Well, uh, you could uh, reach me at uh, the WFUV email address, which is Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. That's D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O. On Facebook, I'd love if you joined me, liked my Facebook page that's called Darren DeVivo on WFUV radio, and I post all kinds of music-related things there and probably spend way too much time on those Facebook pages than I should. So uh, come join me over there. I think I I have the same problem as you do, Darren, spending way too much time on Facebook. (laughs) Alan, how about you? The easiest way to get to me is through Facebook, um, either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Alan Cozen Remixed is more for uh, Beatles stuff, and the other page is more for my sort of other life, but uh, anyone is welcome to pop into either of them. All right. As for me, Ken Michaels, you can reach me by email. 
at everylittlething at att.net. Uh, you can also take a look at my website, which features interviews with lots of people in the Beatles universe, including my own interview with Ken Mansfield, my recent one, when uh, The Roof first came out, and so many different people from authors to musicians. It's there on the website. There's Beatles trivia every single week. You can win one of nine prizes. And sometime later this week, uh, or probably next week, I will have copies of the brand new Blu-ray for Backbeat, which is now being reissued with a lot of bonus material, with interviews with uh, the director and Ian Softly, uh, who is the director, uh, Ian Hart, who played John Lennon, Stephen Dorff, who played Steve Sutcliffe. That will be one of the prizes that you can win on the website. And that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. To reach us by email, Alan, you have the uh, info on that? Yes, I do. It is one word, things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And on Twitter, we're at, at things we said fab. And we have mm-hmm. a Facebook page, which is things we said today, Beatles radio fans. All right. So if you have any ideas for the show, if you'd like to comment about this show or previous shows, we love getting feedback from you. And I love uh, reading our emails and especially all the comments on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. Uh, We really appreciate it. So by all means, please write to us. This has been a wonderful show. Again, thanks to Ken Mansell for joining us. And for Alan Cozen and Darren DeVivo, this is Ken Michaels. Thank all of you for listening. And we will see you next time.